Hi, right, Teardown Time today. What we've got here, this is a uh, Dolby C CP500 digital cinema processor. Um, this is basically the box that sits between the uh, sound pickup head on the projector and the amplifiers that, are, that power the speakers in a cinema system. This is from, I think, about the early 1990s, um, and this handles analog soundtracks as well as Dolby Digital. And this one I just picked up cheap, really out of curiosity, it was going for peanuts. There's a knob on here that's broken off, so I just sort of melted a little slot into it with a soldering iron and a screwdriver so I can actually tweak it. And the front panel controls are fairly basic, obviously this thing is designed to just sit in a projection room and be operated uh, very easily, so you've just got some presets of just that sort of collection of settings depending on the type of film that's being displayed. There's, um, I think that's almost certainly a master volume control there. Um, there's a mute button, a sort of flashing light that warns you that the reason you can't hear anything is that you've got the thing on mute. And there's a few simple uh, setup functions in here. But not a great deal, a lot of it's password protected because obviously if you've got a set, uh, yeah, this all needs to be set up um, for the acoustics and the speaker setup you've got in the cinema, so you don't really want um, people playing with it too much. Um, there's nothing particularly interesting um, in here, there's a 30 to transfer setup data between boxes into a PC um, and a few other just odd bits and pieces, but nothing um, really exciting enough to bother looking at uh, too, too much. So, for example, the alignment thing, you have to enter a password to uh, get into it, so you could cause all sorts of mayhem by just tweaking that. Some diagnostics, which is just basically channel testing and level testing and so on. There's um, also an event log, which obviously is quite useful for diagnostics and um, debugging. There's a few uh, random uh, bits of stuff in there. Just a few possible faults. And on the back, you've, we've got all the connections here. Um, there's connections for the, uh, the film, the actual readers, the read heads, various other bits and pieces to link to the um, various other systems you've got, for example. There's some um, various connectors down here, um, motor start switch, um, RS-232, and there's, a, there's um, a few sort of various general purpose outputs. So, for example, it can integrate with things like li uh, lighting systems, maybe curtain operations, that sort of thing, just to automate the whole process of um, running the uh, film show. There's the automation, automation connector there. Um, power supplies in a separate box on the back. Obviously, that's partly for noise um, reduction, um, partly mechanical, but also for easy replacement. Obviously, one th one thing that's you'll see in quite a lot of aspects of this, it's designed for easy servicing, so obviously if you're running a cinema and your sound system suddenly dies, you're potentially losing a lot of money, um, so you need something that's very quick to service, very easy to diagnose and um, get up and running again. So this power supply just four screws, the whole thing just comes off, so you could carry spares and sort of replace that very quickly. And down here on the, these are plug-in terminal blocks for the audio out, so I was a little bit surprised that they weren't using sort of XLRs or something for the audio, but this thing will be typically installed into a pre-wired rack, so it's not something that will be plugged in and out all the time, so it's probably not unreasonable to use that sort of connection on. These are going to be pretty high-level audio outputs, so noise shouldn't be a major issue on there, because this almost certainly will be sitting right next to the power amplifiers. Uh, one noticeable thing is there's no external on-off switch, because uh, obviously, again, you don't really want to accidentally switch off the sound processor, um, in particular, you know, you may well produce sort of nasty thumpy noises into your um, amplifiers as well if you do that. Typically this will be in a, sort of a rack with all the amplifiers and there's probably just one master switch to turn the whole lot off at the, um, when the cinema closes, so there's no real need to turn this on and off separately. There is actually um, an internal switch, there's a power, it says power stroke bypass, so this will be set up so that um, if there is some failure on here, or maybe if you've got other processors in your um, chain, so if you turn that off, it bypasses any analog audio input, so it passes through. But obviously that's a, a, a non-readily accessible thing, so normal users wouldn't normally uh, access that. You actually have to open it up to get to that. Now you can see the um, construction is basically a rack with various plug-in cards, and obviously there's going to be different versions of this depending on which you know, which facilities are needed. Uh, most of this is to do with the digital processing. There's a lot of an the analog processing stuff over here. There's, sort of, there's a front panel board here that's just got the um, display, and at the bottom here there's the main processor that handles everything else. And there's quite a nice feature here. You've got um, a key that shows which cards go where, what all the adjustments are. Again, to make sort of servicing nice and simple, and then at the front of the rack, there's actually a thing that lists exactly which card goes in which slot. 
So, for example, you know, if the thing suddenly dies, you've got the option of swapping um, swapping cards just to get, you know, get get the system up and running. There is actually something else where one of the managers that said, you know, you can swap the cards over, like in an emergency, but they don't recommend it because there's calibrations and so on that are sort of really need to be done in system. But um, if they give you that option, and they even like give you a sort of emergency contact number to get you up and running. And again, for serviceability, there's lots of, sort of status LEDs, uh, test points, adjustments, all easily accessible. This board here has got uh, 24 lead status indicators and they've all got this red sort of fault indicator so there's obviously going to be some very extensive internal self-testing and sort of, it just lights up red if there's something um, faulty in that card again to, to make it easy to quickly diagnose faults. One thing I was slightly surprised at, there's no sort of card lock, locks and retainers. There are actually some ejection headers on this board here, but of course this isn't this thing isn't going to go anywhere, it's not going to be lugged around, so there's no particular need to latch the cards in to um, stop them falling out. Um, to get it, there's also no handles to grab them, but what they do do they actually give you a little um, little extraction tool. So you can use this to just pull the uh, pull the boards out like that. So let's take a look at these boards and uh, see what's on them. Right, this is the first card. Common theme in, in, in this thing is that there's just tons and tons and tons of analog um, processing. I'm sure that the modern equivalent of this box is just probably a few big DSPs, some FPGAs, and they do it all, all digitally, but um, this thing is just absolutely crammed full of mostly through hole um, analog stuff. There's a couple of relays here which are probably for the bypass. Um, function so it can just bypass itself when there's no power. Um, there's various things like digital pots here. Um, this is an interesting little thing. There's, these are obviously some um, configurable filters. If you look on here, they've got various sort of functions, like delays and filters and so on. But all these are are actually just a, a plug-in header with a bunch of resistors. So these are obviously sort of generic sets of components on the board that are then configured by sort of plugging in sets of resistors to get the actual sort of frequencies and delays they uh, they wanted, which is sort of quite an interesting solution to uh, the problem of sort of making it configurable without having to do lots and lots of different um, PCB builds. So there's sort of quite a few of these. So they're just um, I think they're all I haven't opened all these up, but I think they're all just um, bunches of resistor resistors. Yeah, so just lots and lots of resistors. And so this is all, pretty much all through. Oh, there are a couple of a few surface mount parts here, um, and some of the other boards. Some of them have got a few surface mount bits, but uh, it's mostly through hole. Some multi-turn pots here for all the various analog level um, controls and so on. Most of it is sort of labelled, and you've got the uh, status LEDs on the edge of the end of the board there. This is actually an optional uh, crossover board, so this is where you've got a speaker system where you've got separate um, separate driver units for different frequencies with separate amplifiers. Um, so again, these will be just, just to configure, so you probably use different sets of these depending on the um, characteristics of the speakers as to where the uh, crossover points are. So for example here, there's the base one that's showing sort of 50 and 100 hertz. She says sort of base crossover. And this is the uh, analog output board again, lots and lots of analog, a bit more surface mount on here. There's still most of the resistors and passives though are still through holes, a few um, surface mount up here, but these are just in three two four, so I suspect this probably isn't actually in the audio signal path. They'll probably obviously come like Dolby is you know absolutely um, focused on best possible audio quality, so they're sort of using sort of high quality capacitors, metal film resistors in the signal path, but so there's a few odd surface mounts dotted around. Um, I suspect these diodes here are possibly static and protection to avoid sort of this being damaged by any transients on the uh, cable that's being that's plugged in externally. You've got these sort of coupling capacitors. I think that's probably um, some like an analog switch matrix. There and there's some um, quite a lot of power supply stuff here producing various supply rails. Um, it's got another one of these plug-in things. It's interesting the fact that these ones upside down. I suspect the idea is probably you, you know you unplug that and turn it around to get a different um, filter characteristic. 
and say there's lots of these uh, digital pot chips, I call digital pots, um, 5532 op amps, lots of good analog stuff. There's a few sort of non non fitted uh, adjustments here, and there's a test point, sort of plug in test point there, and again another bunch of uh, a bunch of status LEDs. And this is uh, 1996, so this is the time when sort of surface mount was starting to uh, become more popular, but there's still yeah, huge amounts of through holes. So a lot of these may well have been derived from earlier designs as well. And this is the optical preamp. This is for the analog optical uh, sound pickup head. Again, this is just basically amplifiers. Nothing uh, at all exciting. There's a, a little gal there, which is probably just uh, de decoding logic, just for switching and so on. There's a few more sort of digital pot type things, but the rest is just op amps and um, analog switches and stuff. Fairly unexciting board. These are all um, instantly made in the UK. This module is just a sandwich of a couple of boards. This is the Dolby um, SR decoder module, so this is for noise reduction. This is the analog noise reduction um, from the optical head. Again, this has got different connectors to the rest of it, so I'm guessing this is probably a standard module they used in other earlier products. That, so instead of re engineering this with the same type of connectors for this, they just you know, decided to use this as a standard module. Right, so this is a sort of sandwich of two, uh, two through hole PCBs. Just look at that. I mean, just pure analogness going on there. There's some uh, Dolby custom chips here. Again, a few surface mount bits, but a lot of it is through hole metal film resistors. Um, lots of uh, good quality uh, capacitors there. Say so four, I think these are all the same. These uh, chips have actually got Dolby uh, mark on it. So it's obviously their custom chips for their processing. And this bottom board, again, just all analog op amps, a few analog switches. So this is just about you know, routing and um, buffering and filtering the analog stuff. Fairly impressive density of analog. Um, stuff going on there. This is a, it's a two layer board as well so it's one nice thing about sort of through hole is that the parts are big enough to actually jump over traces so um, you can actually pack it together quite tightly if you um, if you get good at doing the, uh, the board layout. Again a lot of this backside is actually ground plane as well. Actually I just noticed um, that Dolby SR card is in this section that says sort of 70 millimeter mag which I guess is magnetic um, so that's probably for a magnetic rather than an optical soundtrack which would explain why they're using the noise reduction stuff and while we're in here you can see this back plane there's not a great deal on it there's um, a sort of solid ground plane pretty much and there's just a few of these uh, filters these are sort of filters which are basically a capacitor and two ferrite beads so this would just be RF you know, EMI filtering to the outside world and the rest of the back plane is just interconnecting between these cards so, and there's some capacitors there which will be power supply decoupling yeah there's a few um, there's a few jumpers down there which is probably just to configure the signal path around the back plane for different uh, options but not much else really of interest on there and this is the last card in the analog section. This is marked uh, analog to A to D converter and analog switch. So uh, this is obviously um, an audio A to D converter. Some sort of switches here, op amps, and again nothing particularly interesting. There's um, there's a socket there. That's probably just so you can sort of maybe plug some headphones in to monitor the uh, the sound, or perhaps a microphone. So it's got a phantom power um, link there. So perhaps it's a microphone, so you can talk to the uh, auditorium. Uh, getting onto the more digital stuff, this one's marked as uh, optional 6 channel ADC so this is probably for to take analog out inputs and get them into the digital domain for the digital processing uh, it says 6 channels so we've got these uh, nice uh, ACD converters in sort of side braised expensive ceramic packages and quite a lot of surface mount on here, these are just uh, op amps and stuff and analog switches and some um, power supply stuff here. Uh, these are 18 bit uh, two channel audio HD converters, obviously fairly early uh, ones when you know, digital audio 
was quite new. These things were probably horrendously expensive in their day, I'm sure. Well, one thing I noticed about these chips is this lid is very, very big, so I was wondering if this is actually either a very large die or maybe a collection of a few separate die. Um, now, these um, chips are separate lids. Uh, aren't actually that hard to open. They tend to use quite a hard solder though. If you sort of stick it, stab it with the knife, it, it actually feels a lot harder than normal solder. Now, a technique I've used um, quite often to get these off is because that hard solder is quite difficult to melt. If you actually flood it with conventional sort of leaded solder, you um, sometimes find that it'll actually soften up the um, the solder. So if you just give it a good really good heating and just put tons of conventional solder on there let it get nice and hot you sometimes then find you can actually get a blade in just enough to as soon as you actually start you know, start getting into it then um, you can usually just peel it up and it cracks off I think the, you know, the, 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 the softer solder can actually sort of start alloying with the, um, the harder stuff and actually soften it up and make it easier to um, it sort of reduces the melting point and um, softens it enough just to get a knife or some other blade in there. See, there's actually uh, two separate die in there, two quite big ones. And these must have been very expensive chips in their time. And you can see in the data sheet, it actually shows the two separate chips. There's an anal separate analog and digital chip um, to form the uh, AC converter. So the two chips are probably built, yeah, built on different processes, but also the separate chips um, help decouple the noise from the uh, digital section getting into the analog section. And taking a close look at these uh, die, you actually see the uh, digital ones actually made by a different company. I presume this was before the days that analog devices did, did much digital stuff. The digital filter chips actually made by uh, Ensonic. And this is the uh, optional six channel D2A converter board. Um, they're using, um, I think that's Crystal, that logo. Um, audio D2A converters. So again, you've got the audio output stages, nice big chunky capacitors and some of these still um, audio amplifier buffer things. Again, some analog switching, some power, yeah, ind independent power supplies on the board. Right, this one's labelled matrix decoder. There's actually a few of these um, identical boards in different positions with different labels. So this is um, probably a fairly general purpose signal processing board that they use for a few different functions. Um, this is actually a, a dedicated Dolby um, custom processor. It's, it's manufactured by Zoran, but it's a Dolby um, processing uh, chip. There's not, I've had a look at the, the, um, the ROM here, there's only like a couple hundred bytes in there, so that's probably more configuration than sort of major amounts of code in there. There's nothing, uh, no text or anything interesting in there. Uh, there's a high speed UART there, which I'm guessing is probably just a sort of general communication interface between the main processor and the board. There's um, CPL, a couple of CPLD, sort of not CPLDs, um, just PLD, PAL type devices in there. Some uh, RAM here, so that's just a sort of fairly general purpose digital signal processor board, um, some status LEDs. Um, interesting that actually have this connector on the end and just for a bunch of um, LEDs, but one of the other boards has actually um, one of the other boards has actually got top 24 LEDs, so that's but maybe just so they can have more status indicators using the same connector. And this is the sort of kit that's not really built down to a price, so sort of adding extra connectors and so on, it's more about flexibility and uh, maintainability than uh, minimum cost. Right, this is the first board in the digital decoding chain. Basically the sound head has a, a small camera. I couldn't actually find out whether it's a line scan camera or a full frame video camera, but it um, grabs images of the um, the code that's printed on the film in between the sprocket hole holes that looks not unlike a sort of high density QR code, and that contains all the audio information for the frame. So the uh, that's a video A to D converter, so it goes through a high speed A to D converter, then there's various bits of, sort of RAM, there's all these um, PAL chip, yeah, GAL PAL chips doing various sort of digital high speed digital functions, lots and lots of test points, sort of video, um, clamping, tracking, power supplies, so you've got lots of test points there to sort of plug your scope into to, for debugging. 
and alignment and so on. So what's going to be happening on here is the, sort of the videos going through some analog processing into the A to D converter, then into these RAM chips controlled by the logic in these um, PLDs. So this is maybe buffering a whole line uh, or acting like a FIFO that's then feeding that data onto um, the rest of the system to process the information and turn it into sound. Uh, this is one of two identical video processing boards and this board, um, each board looks like it's got two sections on it. I'm sure what they're doing here is using four, effectively four DSPs in parallel to do the, the, the task of getting that video image, recognising where the data is, decoding the data, doing any error correction. For a task like that, you know, if, you can't, if you don't have the speed to do it on one processor, then it's a task that's very easy to sort of split out. They can either give um, each processor one frame in turn, so you have like a four frame pipeline and each processor is allocated one frame in that sequence, or possibly one processor is allocated uh, one part of the frame to deal with, but obviously this is, this is 1993, so it's fairly old technology, so it's doing you know, quite a lot of fairly clever stuff for the time, so obviously they couldn't do it in one chip, so they split it out onto two processors on uh, each of two boards, but as you can see, you know, you've clearly got pretty much identical um, stuff across the two sides of this board. Again, I've had a look in these right, EEPROMs, there's very little in there. Again, there's a couple of PLDs, um, more RAM here, so this is going to be taking the, the data out of that video uh, memory, decoding it, and um, there's probably some FIFO buffers on here to produce an audio stream from that recognised video data. Now, this board's labelled System Services, so I'm guessing this is probably in charge of the, the whole audio decoding thing. There's another DSP on here, there's um, an error correction processor down here, there's status display, there's a, a selector here which I'm guessing maybe you turn that to show the status of various different um, processes, an oscillator, there's a can in here, what's uh, inside that, let's take a look. Oh, not much under this, I'm, I can only assume this is just for shielding, uh, there's a high speed op amp here, um, I wonder if maybe this is to do with the front end video processing, there's a D2A converter here. So perhaps this is actually doing some of the sort of, a little bit of analog pre-processing on the um, video signal from the pickup head before it goes to the uh, the other processing. But um, not really sure. Here you see there's a sort of cutout from the main ground plane and the PCB there. So that's clearly de you know, dealing with some sort of high speed stuff. I can only assume it's the video signal. I can't really think what else um, it will be dealing with on this. And this last board in the chain, this is a uh, sample rate converter and it's using a, a dedicated chip which is specifically designed for sample rate conversion of uh, audio signals. And this is the main system control board in the bottom, this is obviously the, uh, the main processor that just handles everything in terms of management, user interface and so on. Um, tons of these 100 ohm damping resistors for driving the back plane, sort of bus buffers, main processor which is a uh, 68HC16Z. Um, Quite a lot of stuff in these ROMs, but again, it's just all the menus and user interface and stuff. Nothing uh, particularly exciting. Um, another one of these uh, UART chips, which is probably communicating to the other boards. So there's a battery here. There's a real-time clock um, crystal here. There's probably some battery backed up memory, maybe in the uh, processor for storing the uh, settings and so on. Uh, reset button. Some test points just for supply voltages, and that's just the link to the front panel user interface. Again, resistors for damping um, an EMC, so that's all pretty straightforward uh, sort of control PCB. And on the front here, we've just got this cover, two uh, rather grubby fans that sort of blow air through these uh, slots. We've got just um, that's the LCD, the encoder, and that's really it. There's an um, inverter for the cold cathode backlight there. But um, there's a board option probably for an alternate type of uh, inverter. They've been a little bit naughtier. They've actually got the ground plane going right up to the pins and seeing this can have a good few hundred volts on it, they, that ground plane really ought to have been backed off of there a little bit. But uh, apart from that, it's uh, pretty well made. One minor little detail here, also you've got this PCB with this massive great hole in it. So this is quite a big waste of both PCB but also um, for the assembly process. So what they've actually done, this little board is on a this has got the encoder in the display which is just stepped off just to get the right spacing for the front. So you can actually see the breakout tabs on here. So when they manufacture it, this actually board, this board actually sit, sits in here for the PCB and the assembly process, then it just gets snapped off and um, stuck down there. That's a fairly common technique for where you've got anything that's got a set of PCBs, 
you sort of do the whole thing as a uh, as a set. Particularly if you've got like an area like this, which is otherwise wasted, you sort of use up that space um, just to reduce your production cost. Because you know, when you've got a set like this, you know, you're, there's no way you're ever going to have different numbers of each board. So you just do the whole thing as one set, assemble it all, and then just snap it snap it apart afterwards. So a nice bit of very well made professional kit, no doubt um, very expensive in its day, but uh, fairly obsolete now with digital projectors. Interesting thing I noticed on here on some of these diagnostics, they even tell you sort of how to set the scope up to test it for the digital stuff. Um, that 7 segment display shows the, the error rate, so if that starts climbing maybe you know, that's time to start cleaning your uh, the optics or look at the quality of the film. Again there's just lots of um, ledgers describing all the various uh, fault codes to make it easy to uh, diagnose errors. In what? In what? In what? What? Dolby. In Dolby. I mean, you can't. In Dolby. She means Dolby, all right? She means Dolby. You know exactly well what she means. You shan't recover from this one. You shan't recover from this one. Oh, come on. Can I have a small?